In today's video, I'm going to go through an entire calculus test. This is test number three in the main sequence here at the University of Cincinnati. Now, the idea for you, I think, should not be just to sit and watch me just do this entire test that is meant to take students an hour. What I think the idea is just to try the test on your own. I'm going to leave a copy of the test available so you can do it. Try the test on your own and then come to the video and jump around to find the specific questions that you want to verify your answers on. All right, first problem. What we've been given here is some derivative, some f prime, which is 3 to the x plus 2 sine of x. And then we also have this little piece of information that f of 0 is 3, and what we are being asked for is to figure out what f of pi is. So that is, I have the derivative, and I want to come up with an antiderivative, but a specific one. I want the constant to be fixed so that this f of 0 is 3, and then I can figure out what f of pi is. So let's go and try to figure out what the antiderivative is first. So I'm going to take the integral of the f prime, so of the 3e e to the x plus 2 sine of x, and all of that dx. And this is an integral that I can more or less do. So 3e e to the x, its antiderivative is just 3e e to the x. A sine of x is going to go to a minus cosine, so minus twice, the 2 comes along for the ride, cosine of x. And then this is important, you have to put in a final plus c. I am doing an indefinite integral at this point, I get a plus c. Now, what is that c value? Well, this is how I can use that f of 0 is equal to 3 business. Because what I can say that if this in gen is generically equal to the function f of x, then if I want to go and figure out what f of 0 is going to be, well, this is 3 times e to the 0, and e to the 0 is just 1, so 3 times 1. And then cosine of 0 is also 1, so minus 2 times 1, so minus 2. And then that gives me my specific value that c is equal to 2. So now if I want to figure out what my generic uh, function is going to be, my f of x for all values is 3e e to the x minus 2 cosine of x as we've had before, but now I know what the plus c is, I can write plus 2. Final thing, I need to figure out what f of pi is going to be, so I just plug pi into here, so f of pi is, well, 3e to the pi, that's kind of a funny one. Then cosine of pi is minus 1, I already have a minus sign out there, so the minus becomes a plus now, so plus 2 times 1, and then plus 2, so it looks like 3e to the pi plus 4, do I have one of those, that looks like option D. Next problem. This problem is a net change problem. It says water flows simultaneously into a tank at a particular flow rate, 1 plus 4t cubed, and it flows out of a tank at a different flow rate, in this case 3t squared, both in liters per minute. And the question is, what is the net change during the first two minutes? So, in other words, I am doing a definite interval from 0 up to 2. This represents the first two minutes. And I can put both the inflow and the outflow into the same integrand. I can say that this is going to be the 1 plus 4t cubed, that's the inflow amount, and then you are subtracting off the 3t squared, that is the outflowing amount, so inflow minus outflow is the total net flow, and then all of this integrated dt. All right, so let's do this. Okay, so 1 is going to have uh, integrate to 2, uh, 4t cubed is going to be plus t to the power of 4, and then minus t cubed, and it looks like everything was sort of destined to work out very nicely. Derivative of t cubed is 3t squared. You can always go back and check these. And then I'm evaluating it at 0 and 2. First, I need to plug in 2. So 2 plus 2 to the fourth minus 2 cubed. So that's evaluating it at 2. And then I need to subtract off evaluating at 0. This is going to be easy. 0 plus 0 minus 0. And then final thing, okay, so 2 to the power of 4 is 2, 4, 8, 16. Then I'm going to be subtracting off 8, which is 8, plus 2, 10. Looks like I've got 10. Very nice. And this is indeed in liters because the integrand is in liters per minute. I integrate out time, I get 2 liters. So I have sort of a unit analysis check. I'd always recommend that you, when you find your antiderivative here, that you take its derivative and verify it is what you have in the integrand. You plug in your values. All right, next up. Now, this problem says 
that I have a particular limit of a sum of some stuff. And then this is going to be equal to, using a right Riemann sum, so right endpoints, on the interval 0 to 2, it's equal to one of these definite intervals, but which one? So there's a couple of formulas that are important to remember here. The first is that delta x is generically b minus a all divided out by n. And in this particular case, you're, when your b and your a are 2 and 0, this is going to be a width of 2 divided by n. And I notice that when I look actually in this integrand, I, I see that I've got a 2 divided by n there, and that I see that I've got a 2 divided by n right there. Uh, the other little formula you need to know is, well, what about the xi's if I'm using right endpoints? Well, the general is that you start on the far left, and then you go over 1 delta x, 2 delta x, 3 delta x, generically i delta x. So the formula to remember is that you start at a, and you go over plus i delta x. If you forget these formulas, by the way, I always like to come along and have a little picture in my mind here. So if there's my A and there's my B, and I think about dividing this up into a bunch of rectangles, well, the width of one of those rectangles is delta x, and then something like that, that x1 there is the coordinate of A plus one copy of delta x, and x2 would be A plus two copies of delta x, and so on, sort of down the line. So either way, I've got my xi. And in this specific example, the a is 0, the delta x is 2 over n, so a plus i 2 over n. So look at the formula, I've got that delta x there, and actually 2 i over n, that's exactly my xi, so there's my xi. So then I just have to find an indefinite, or definite integral rather that kind of looks like this. So 0 to 2, okay, they're all that, that <laughs> sort of comes for free. Um, the 2 over n is going to go, which is our delta x, it's going to become the dx. I don't want any sort of... 2 over n type things remaining, but I do want a log, and I want a 1 plus x. So log 1 plus x looks like the value of c. The x, that portion comes in to be the xi, and the dx becomes the delta x. Wonderful. This problem is a problem about log rules. Uh, I see that I've got a 1 to 2, an 8 to 1, a 2 to 8, but there's this rule called additivity of the domain. And what it says is that, in general, if I take the integral from 1 all the way up to 8 of f of x dx, I can break up this domain into being the integral from 1 up to 2 of f of x dx, and the integral from 2 up to 8 of f of x dx. So this is the property additivity of domain, and the basic idea of additivity of domain is that a larger region can be written as the sum of some smaller regions, and you just add them up, and that gives you the total area of the larger region. Now, what am I actually trying to solve for? I am trying to solve for 2 to 8, but notice there's a sneaky 2 there. I'm actually asking twice f of x, but, but let me figure it out for f of x first, and then I'll just multiply by 2. The 2 that I have here, it can come out the front if I so wish. So I'm going to figure out this right hand 2 to 8 of f of x dx, and then I'm going to come back and figure out what twice that is by multiplying by 2. Now, 1 to 8, the only problem is I don't have 1 to 8, I have 8 to 1. So if 8 to 1 is minus 7, then 1 to 8 is going to be 7. So this left guy over here is going to be 7. The 1 to 2 is going to be equal to 3, and then I have my question mark here, so that tells me that the integral from 2 to 8 of f of x dx, my question mark, is 7 minus 3, which is equal to 4. And then that tells me if I have twice this value, because I'm interested in twice that, it's going to go to 8. So I can circle the value of 8. Wonderful. Okay, next problem is a Riemann sum problem. I have some function. I want to figure out, well, what is the Riemann sum of it using left endpoints and using three of them. So if I draw myself sort of a quick graph, and you don't have to do this, but I'd like to do this. So this is a graph here of 9 minus x squared. And we're going to be going from, uh, well, first of all, I can say when, when do they sort of intersect the, the x-axis? We know that this value here is minus 3, and that value there is plus 3. So I have a minus 3 and a plus 3. Now, what I'm actually asking is to go from minus 2, so a little bit to the right of that 0, over here to 4, which is a little bit to the right of the 0. So that's kind of interesting. And then I'm going to also put 
minus 2 to 0, 0 to 2, and 2 to 4. So if I'm using left endpoints, then I'm going to be talking about this point right there, uh, this point right there, and this point right there, the ones at minus 2, 0, and 2. You might think, hold on, Trevor, aren't you going from all the way up to 4? But no, but the final interval, the one that goes 2 to 4, using the left endpoint of that, so that's only 2. So final story, my sum is going to be equal to the value of f at minus 2 times an interval width of 2 plus f at 0, the second endpoint, times a width of 2, so height times space, and then a height of 2, and again a width of 2. The width of 2 is the same every time. If I plug minus 2 in here, so 9 minus, minus 2 squared is going to be a 5 times 2, so 5 times 2 is 10. If I plug in 0, I'm going to get 9, so I get a 9 times 2, which is 18. If I plug in a 2 here, I get again a 5 times another 2, so another 10. So 18, 28, 38. And there's my answer right there. Halfway through the multiple choice. This problem you should be on the lookout for. It. it is a fundamental theorem of calculus number one. And the reason that I can do or know that that's the case is first of all, I'm looking that it's not an integral just by itself, it's the derivative of the integral. And then second of all, it's the derivative of an integral where there is an x in that limit. There's a, a square root x up to five of log t dt. So I want to be using my fundamental theorem of calculus and I remind you that the fundamental theorem of calculus says it's the integral from any value of a up to x of f of t dt, and this is not f of t, it is f of x. The derivative of the integral, they sort of cancel, but there's this kind of weirdness to it, uh, in particular that, that if it was an integrand of f of t, that t is a dummy variable, but this accumulation function is a function of x, so our final answer is f of x. Now, a couple problems. Number one, first of all, I don't have an x. Uh, I don't even have it in the right location. Right now, you see how the square root of x is down here at the bottom and not up at the top? So that's problem one, that I need to flip the order of this. And I can do that fair enough. I can say this is negative of the derivative with respect to x of 5 up to square root of x of log of t dt. So I take the minus sign and that flips it to it's the right way so it's compatible with fundamental theorem of calculus. Second issue. It's not just an x, it's a square root of x. So I have to use a little bit of a chain rule here. Uh, it's not just up to x, it's up to some function of x. So when I do the chain rule, it's derivative of the outside, at the inside, at the square root x, times the derivative of the inside, times the derivative of the square root x. So what am I going to get? It's going to be, well, that negative sign. And then the fundamental theorem of calculus says the derivative of the integral cancel in the following sense. It's log, but not log of t, log of whatever the function is, so log of root x. And then it's multiplied by the derivative of root x. And so this is going to be, well, 1 half x to the minus 1 half. And let's see whether we have that answer in there. It looks like we do answer e. All right, moving right along. This next question is just sort of an annoying little trick. It's just a spot of algebra. It's not a big deal. Basically, what we notice is that, look, there's a quotient. There's no quotient rule for integrals that we're going to be busting out here. So we have to just do some algebra to make it look like a power rule. And the trick is this. I want to do the integral from 1 up to 2. I have a sum in the numerator, and I'm allowed to break up the sums in numerator. So I can say that this is just 2x over x cubed. And x over x cubed is like just x squared on the bottom, uh, plus x cubed over x cubed, and x cubed over x cubed is just like 1. So there we have that answer, 2 over x squared plus 1 dx. Okay, now what can I do? Well, uh, I have to do an antiderivative of these two different things. First, I've got the 2 over x squared, so I'll put the, the 2 out the front. This is x to the minus 2, so it's antiderivative of x to the minus 2 plus 1, so x to the minus 1, and then all divided out by minus 1, and then finally plus x, and then I'm going to evaluate this entire thing that I have between the x values of 1 and 2. 2 first. So I have a minus 2, and then the x to the minus 1 when I plug in 2 is going to be a 2 on the bottom, plus 2, all right, that's plugging 2 in. And then I subtract off plugging 1 in here, so I have a minus 2 plus 1. 
So I've got a minus 1 and a 2 is a 1. A minus 2 and a 1 is a minus 1. But because of the minus sign outside, it becomes a plus 1, plus 1, 2. Right? Okay, what do we want to do here? Now look, it's very similar to the previous problem. It's got a sum, but because the sum is down on the denominator now, you can't split it up in that same way. We have to use a u substitution. And what I notice is that in the denominator, there's an x squared term, but on the numerator, there's just an x term, and derivative of x squared is a 2x. So outside of the 2 figuring out, it looks like the derivative of the denominator is sort of up to constant the numerator. So let's try this. Let's set u equal to x squared plus 1. And that is going to imply that my du is going to be equal to 2x dx. And in fact, I actually have 4x dx. I have twice that value. Now, I have an indefinite integral here. Excuse me, I have a definite integral. I've got a 0 and a 4 there. So I have to figure out what happens there. Well, u at x equal to 0, like if I plugged in x equal to 0 here, would be 1. And u at x equal to 4. 4, if I plug in 4 for this value, would be 4 squared is 16 plus 1 is 17. So this whole thing is equal to the integral from 1 up to 17. I've switched my limits of integration. Can't forget that part. I've got 4x dx, not 2x dx. So it is twice the value of du and then divided out by u. And so how do I do this? Well, the 2 comes along for the ride. The antiderivative of 1 over u is log of absolute value of u. So log of absolute value of u, and then evaluate it between 1 and 17, which is 2 log of 17 minus 2 log of 1. And log of 1 is just 0, so twice log of 17. We have the result. 8, do we have one more multiple choice? That's it, we're done with the multiple choice. On to the rhythm. Now, I really like this particular rhythm problem. Uh, this is one where I've got an accumulation function. g of x is the integral from 0 up to x of some function f of t dt. And the graph, not of g, but of f is given. That's what I put down here, the graph of f. So I have to interpret g from this graph of f. Now, what kind of questions do I ask about this? Well, first kind of question I ask is find each of the following. First of all, g of 1. So if I look at what my g was, this is like plugging in 1. So that would be the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx. Well, 0 to 1 of f of x dx is that area right there. So the integral from 0 up to 1 of f of x dx, what am I going to do here? I'm going to say that this is just the area of that triangle and signed area, by the way. This has a width of 1, a height of 2. So 1 half of base times height is just going to be 1. And because it's negative, minus 1. All right. G of 9, well, now I have to shade in all of this other stuff going all the way over to G of 9. There's a lot more areas to figure out. So it's the minus 1 I've already figured out. Uh, then I have another triangle here, the one above the x-axis. I'm going to figure that one out, and it's going to be a width of 3, 1 half for 1 half based on heights, uh, a width of 3 and a height of 2. Uh, then I have this little portion between 4 and 6 here, another triangle, so a 1 half width of 2 times a height of 2. I then have a square, which has a, uh, excuse me, but this last one here shouldn't be a plus, should be a minus sign because it's beneath. I then have another minus sign for my square going from 6 to 8, which is a 2 times 2. And then finally, one more 1 half. It is 1 half a base times height, so a uh, 1 times 2. So just basically looking at these either triangles or squares and adding them up by looking at it, but either way, g of 9 is this area moving right along. Now we want to do g prime of 7, and the big idea here is this. If I look at what g prime is, g prime is an accumulation function, so its derivative is the derivative of the integral from 0 to x of f of t to t. But we have the fundamental theorem of calculus that says the derivative of the integral, of the, the derivative of the accumulation function is just its integrand is just f of x. That is, this g prime of 7 is just the same thing as f of 7. And g double prime of 7 is therefore f prime of 7. It's sort of the derivative of the derivative. Okay, so what's f of 7 and f prime of 7? Looking back up, well, uh, 7 looks down like it's going to be the value of x equal to minus 2. So I can do that. f of 7 is minus 2. And then f 
prime of 7, well, this is the slope at this particular value. Well, the slope is horizontal, right? There's no rise, and so we can say this is equal to 0. All right, increasing and then absolute maximum. Let's go back and look at my graph. But look at my graph. Where is this increasing? Well, it, starting at 0, it begins negative, where you're adding sort of negative areas, areas beneath the x-axis. And then it's at positive for a while. It goes big, 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 increasing all the area where you're adding positive stuff and then decreasing again. So I think the maximum happens at this value of 4 here, where you've been adding all this positive stuff, going as large as you can in terms of your area under the curve, and then you start going down again. So I'm going to say that my g of x has an absolute maximum at 4, and that it is increasing on 1 up to 4. Another way to think about this is it's increasing when its derivative is positive, but its derivative was just the function value of f of x. And so I'm basically just asking, where is this function value positive? Well, it's positive from 1 to 4. All right, u substitution. The big trick with all these u sub problems is trying to figure out what is a useful u. Like if you just chose ln of x, then you would have like the one were not accounted for. If you made the entire denominator the u, well, the du would be super messy. If you put the u to be the one plus two ln of x cubed, you get three times all of that mess squared when you try to take its derivative. There's a lot of possible u's that as soon as you try them, they don't work out. So what does work out? If I go and set u to be sort of the inside of the biggest chunk I can think of, well, I have a block cubed, so let's just set it to be the inside of that, 1 plus 2 ln of x, and then we will get u cubed when you go and plug it in. If that's my u, then my du is going to be equal to 2 over x dx, and I can then go and rearrange this. Okay, I don't, I, I see that I have an x and I see that I have a dx, I'm missing the 2, so I have to put a half out the front, so 1 half. But then I can say this is the integral of just a du over u cubed. You do a power rule, the 1 half comes along for the ride, it goes to u to the power of minus 3 plus 1 is minus 2. I divide out by that minus 2, and I add a plus c because I'm doing an indefinite integral. Right? Uh, final thing, I can't just leave it as u, I have to go and actually plug in for the value of x. I, I, I had an integral in terms of x, I want my final answer in terms of x as well, that's our agreement. So I will write 1 half, and in fact I will come along and say not 1 half, I'm going to say that it is going to be minus 1 quarter when the 2's multiply. And then I'm going to have the u, which is 1 plus 2 ln of x, substituting it back in and all the power of minus 2, final, plus c. Alright, next one. Okay, another u sub, there's a natural guess for your u, it's the inside of the, you know, the power again. We did u cubed last time, now we're doing u to the one half, let's try that. So x minus 4, uh, du is very simple in that case, dx, but there's a problem, and the problem is this x right here. If I go and try to plug in u and I get x square root u du, but how do I deal with my x? I have to do this thing called back substitution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange my formula and I'm going to say that x is going to be equal to u plus 4. So now when I've got this x, I can make that into a u as well. So this is going to become the integral of u plus 4 times square root of u du. And now this is one I can just go and multiply out. So this is u to the 1 times u to the half is u to the 3 halves. And 4u to the 1 half, all of that multiplied by du. Wonderful. Now I want to use my power rule to do the find antiderivative. u to the 3 half plus 1 is u to the 5 halves. Divided out by 5 halves is the same thing as multiplying by 2 fifths. And then plus, and I'll make the 4 here. Now it goes to u to the 1 half plus 1 is u to the 3 halves. Divided by 3 halves, or if you prefer, multiply by 2 thirds. And then finally, it's an indefinite integral, so I owe you a plus c. Okay. Uh, final thing I want to do is I actually have this u, it's an x minus 4, let's go and plug that in. So 2 fifths x minus 4 to the 5 halves plus 8 thirds x minus 4 to the 3 halves plus c. And that's our final answer. All right, wonderful. Moving right along. Okay, we have some sort of optimization problem, it appears here. Uh, let's try to read it. A tank has a rectangular base and rectangular sides, but open on the top. So I'm making a box with the open on the top. It's constructed so it has a width of 4 meters 
and that its volume is 36 cubic meters. Okay, so it seems like one of these three sides, I've got, I've got a width, the length, and the height. It sounds like the width is specified, it has to be four. Um, and when building the tank, it costs $10 per square meter for the base and $5 per square meter for the sides. We want to find the length of X such that the side of the base is the minimum cost of the tank. Um, all right, so I guess we're trying to, to find sort of an X value we're going to write it in terms of. Now, I notice that I have a constraint here. My constraint is that my volume is 36 cubic meters. So my volume, which is 4xy, base times width times height, that uh, this has to be 4xy, or sorry, width times length times height, I guess, 4 times x times y. And all of this is equal to 36. So that tells me xy is 9. Or in other words, y is 9 divided out by x. So I can use this a little bit later. If I have a y in my formulas, I want to get rid of it, I can do that. Now I want to find the cost of this thing. Okay, well, how can I do that? One of the things that I know here is that my cost function, which I'm initially going to write in terms of x and y, so I'll write cost of x and y, well, in this case, it's the cost I'm optimizing where the constraint was the volume. It could be the other way around, right? I, I could have gone the other direction, give a fixed cost, and ask you to optimize the volume. But right now, the thing I'm trying to optimize is the cost. So it says it is $10 for the base. The base is 4 times x. There's only one of them. So $10 times 4 times x. And then, then I'm going to have $5 for the size. But there's two different sort of types of size. It's a rectangle. There's two versions, so I put two, of the ones that are 4 times x. Uh, excuse me, that are four times y. So that would look like one of those guys. That's going to be a four times y. But I'm also going to have these ones on the side that are like an x times y. They also cost five dollars. There's also two of them, sort of front and back. And this one is going to be x times y. Now, I need to use this y equals nine over x formula so that I can make my cost function entirely in terms of x. So this is first going to be a 40x. Then it's a 10, I've got a 40y, but it's a 40y where y is 9 over x. So 9 times 4 is 36, so 360 divided out by x. And then 5 times 2 times x times y. So 10 times uh, y is going to become, which is 9 over x, is going to become a 90. And then x over x, so don't have to worry about it, just get this. So there's my cost function, it's a function of x. Find the critical number. Okay, I have to figure out what C prime of x is going to be. Well, derivative of 40 is just, 40x is just 40. Then minus 360 over x squared. And our critical number is when this is going to be equal to 0. Bring in the x squared divided by 10 to make myself a little life a little bit easier. It's 4x squared is equal to 36, which means x squared is equal to 9 which means x is equal to plus or minus 3. And the idea of the side length of a box being negative is just such nonsense. I don't have to worry about it. It's just the positive root. x is equal to 3. That's my critical number. All right, moving along, use the second derivative and first derivative to test, or the first derivative to verify that c has a minimum at the critical number. Because, right, we've got this critical number, but it could be one of those midpoints that doesn't do anything. It could be a maximum. Who knows? Well. If I go and look at what my c prime is right here, I'm going to use first derivative test. So c prime, I'm going to come along and I'm going to put this value, there's my value of 3. Well, imagine x was bigger than that. And that would mean that the negative term that I have here, that negative term would be a smaller negative term. So it would be positive. So it's positive over here. If my x was smaller than 3, the negative term would be do more dominant. It would become a negative. And so we've got a negative to a positive. It is therefore going to be so a minimum. So given this constrained volume, we have minimized the cost. And one more problem, a graphing problem always like this. This is where I give you all these different components, f, f prime, f double prime, and I try to graph them. So domain, well, domain is everywhere where I don't have a division by zero or a square root of something or a log of zero, any of those types of problems. Uh, e to the x is never zero, so the domain is everything, minus infinity to infinity. If I want to set 
x equal to zero, then that would give me my f was zero, my y was zero. If I wanted to set my y was zero, then it'd give me my x equal to zero. So there's only one intercept, it's zero, zero. It's both the x and the y intercept. All right, next up, f is increasing where f prime is positive. So I want to know uh, where my f prime is positive here. And I notice that I have this value of one. And that if I'm bigger than one, it's negative, and if it's smaller than one, it's gonna be positive. So I can say that it's increasing on minus infinity up to that value of one. Uh, concave up, now I'm gonna do my second derivative, one similar kind of idea. When it's to the right, though, it's positive, and to the left, it's negative, that's f prime and f double prime. So concave up on two up to infinity. Okay, uh, vertical asymptotes are where the denominator is zero, so there are none, the denominator is never zero. Okay, horizontal asymptotes, this is where you x goes to positive infinity or minus infinity. Let's do positive infinity first. e to the x goes to positive infinity, so x divided by e to the x, that's going to be going down to zero. So we have a horizontal asymptote, a horizontal asymptote of zero on the right. On the left, well, what happens here, if you go to minus infinity, e to the minus infinity is zero, you get an x over a zero, so this is going to be blowing up. So we have a one-sided horizontal asymptote of y equal to zero, and that only occurs on the right-hand side. All right, so let's use all the pieces of information we know and try to graph this thing. Uh, the first thing I like to plug in is just anything where you've got some actual sort of a point. So for example, for x equal to zero, I have that point right there. That was going to be the x and y intercept. What else did we know? Well, we knew that eventually we have a horizontal asymptote over here, so this is going to the value of y equal to zero. And remember, that horizontal asymptote was only from the right. Okay, and then we also know that from the left, this is going to be going to minus infinity. So sort of as x goes to minus infinity, the function value also goes to minus infinity. So we have some sort of, you know, thing on the left here, which is going to be going down as well. Now, what else do I know? Uh, we know, and I'm going to sort of uh, put this up over here on the top, is that we know from 2 to minus infinity, that that's the portion where it is concave down. And then we know that from minus infinity all the way up to 1, this is the portion where it's increasing. So we saw those intervals as well. So I'm sort of keep those in my mind. And, and I know that I have this sort of value of 1. I can sort of figure out what happens there. And I have this value of 2. Those were the two interesting places. So at 2, it was an inflection point. It went from concave up to concave down. And at 1, well, it's going to be a maximum. It goes from increasing to decreasing. One other thing I can do is I have this maximum at 1 and this inflection point at 2. I can figure out what the heights of those are going to be. Like if I go back and I try to plug in x equal to 1, that's the maximum, or x equal to 2, and I plug it in there, well, I get, for x equal to 1, 1 over e, that's a fraction, it's some number less than 1. And then if I plug in 2, I get 2 over e squared, also a fraction less than 1. So I don't know exactly what those values are, but I can see that if I have my sort of graph here, they're, they're both going to be less than 1. So let's try to put all the pieces of information together. So we know that... Going up to 1, it is increasing in a concave down way. So I can sort of take this graph here. Increasing, 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 but concave down. It goes through 0, 0, and I'm going to stop it right there. I'm going to have this maximum, some, some number between 0 and 1 here. Then I know it is going to start decreasing, but still in a concave down way. So decreasing in a concave down way. And at, and at the value of 2, it's my inflection point, and it switches to being decreasing still but now it's going to be concave up. So there's not a lot of room to here because I, my height is kind of low here, but I'm going to be decreasing in a concave down way, hits the inflection point, and now decreasing in a concave up way and just sort of flattens out to go into the horizontal asymptote at y equal to zero. So my big sort of strategy for these types of problems is plug in the points you know, like the intercepts, like the critical numbers, like the inflection points, that gives you a few sort of dots. And then you fill in the dots by looking, is it increasing or decreasing, and is it concave up or concave down in each of the regions that you're considering.